Let's discuss extraction of four impacted wisdom teeth, sectioning the lower teeth. Now this was a surgical case on impacted wisdom teeth. If you want a lot of surgical cases and a lot of cases on almost everything in dentistry plus many comprehensive complete cases, hit the blue link in the description below and subscribe to DentistryMasterClasses.com. Now let's do skull drill before we start. These maxillary wisdom teeth should be fairly straightforward. We'll just place a periodontal uh, elevator here and here and begin the elevation, then come back with a 301 elevator and the tooth should just roll right out. Be sure you put a two by two in the mouth to protect the airway on both sides. The mandibular impacted wisdom teeth, you can see the tooth is slanted into the second molar. And so, and there's bone on the distal of the tooth. So this one, unless you can elevate it straight up, probably won't be able to elevate it into the bone on the distal of the tooth. So you're gonna have to remove a little tooth structure on the distal as well as section that tooth in this direction to the frication. This tooth could elevate straight out, but if there's bone on the distal of that tooth, it won't elevate into the bone. So you may have to section it or at least cut off the distal coronal part of that tooth. Now remember, these wisdom teeth and surgery videos are not intended to teach you how to take teeth out or do the surgery from scratch. If you don't have any hands-on training in surgical techniques, in this case, taking out impacted wisdom teeth, I don't think you want to try this if you're depending on this video to teach you how to do it because I'll try to cover all the points, but surgery really requires hands-on hands -on training, in my opinion. And this is these videos are intended to enhance the technique of those that already have training in surgery prior to watching the videos. So I'm giving uh, nerve block as well as intraligamental injections. Watch this video on how to give painless and profound local anesthesia. Same thing, a long buckle, buckle injection. And then I'm injecting into the uh, periodontal ligament space around the wisdom tooth. If you're having trouble getting profound anesthesia, you're not giving intraligamental injection. So always, if you're extracting a tooth, doing endodontics, crown preps, anything of significance, I suggest you give an intraligamental injection and you can see how to do that in the, uh, vid the video library of dentistrymasterclasses.com on how to give painless and profound local anesthesia. And I'm giving it on both sides. So we're removing the lower left wisdom tooth first. I always start with the lower left, then the upper left, then the lower right, then the upper right. I do the ones, the most difficult ones first. They're most difficult because they're on the other side of the patient. I'm on the right side, so that's easier than the left side. So as I said, you're doing skull drill ahead of time, chances are though I'm going to need to section either here to here or ideally straight through to the frication area. Now I'm not too worried about the inferior alveolar nerve because I've got this much space between the apex of the roots and the frication. Now if, I, if the roots were not formed, if this was just a, like a marble then you worry more about the inferior alveolar nerve, especially if it's more impacted than this. So I'm always thinking about the inferior alveolar nerve, but I'm not too worried about it in this case. So I would measure with my applicator or application on my computer the distance from the occlusal, occlus occlusal surface of the tooth to the frication, so I've got a general idea of how far that is. I'm cutting a distal wedge here. Remember, you cut the distal wedge so you can take this tissue out and have access to the tooth and can approximate the flaps better. And you're cutting from the distal buckle of the second molar to the distal lingual of the second molar back to a point. And then I'm cutting straight across the tissue, the distal to the second molar. 
And with a periodontal elevator, I'm removing that distal wedge. Then I'm elevating this flap with my periodontal elevator and my surgical scissors. I'm cutting the periosteum so I can reflect the flap and not cut the tissue as I'm uh, removing or creating a space here from which to remove the tooth. Now on the distal of the tooth, I'm trying to cut the distal of the tooth primarily and not the bone because I'm losing the tooth anyway. I'd rather not cut that distal bone. So you just want the space so you can often create the space by primarily just cutting away the distal part of the tooth. Now I'm sectioning through the tooth from the occlusal surface to the frication. And this is a long shank, number uh, four or number six. This is probably a number four surgical burr. You're being careful not to go lingually past the lingual plate. You're gonna stay in the tooth. I'm not gonna section all the way through the tooth lingually because I don't want to take a chance on damaging that lingual nerve. Now people will say, what about using a high-speed handpiece and an air embolism in the tissue, soft tissue? It's not an issue if you don't reflect the lingual flap past the keratinized gingiva. There's you want some attached gingiva connecting that flap to the alveolar bone. Don't make a big lingual flap and then blow air under that flap or you'll get an air embolism, which is not the end of the world, but it it's, sounds like wrapping paper, pop, 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 when you touch it. I saw several of these when I was in my oral surgery fellowship. So just don't do it. Just don't reflect a flap on the lingual. And then you, you also don't want to blow air. You also don't want to blow this compressed air under the buccal flap, but it's generally when people get an air embolism, it's on the lingual. So don't reflect a lingual flap. Just cut the wedge and that's plenty of access. Now I'm using a 30, E301 elevator and just elevating that distal part. I need a little more space back there to elevate it into. Don't get in a hurry when you're doing this. It's difficult because it's in the distal part of the, the back part of the mouth harder to get to. You want to be sure you've got enough flap reflected to have good access. Again, using the 301, taking that distal part out, creating a little more space. Now I'm using a periodontal, periosteal elevator. There's the distal part of the tooth. Now, what I'm doing here is just, I drilled a hole in the mesial part of the tooth, and I'm using this elevator, this one with a pointy tip on it, using that elevator to elevate that piece with that hole, and now I'm using the 301 to remove the other pieces of the tooth. Then I'm going back to remove the follicular sac that was around the wisdom tooth. Why do you want to remove this? because a dentigerous cyst can form from a follicular sac and an ameloblastoma can form from the dentigerous cyst. So you want to remove that follicular sac. Don't curette it because there's a nerve down there. Just remove it with your rongiers and it'll peel right out. Then irrigate it well. Here's a socket. Now I'm placing this socket paste in resorbable gauze in the socket. And you might want to watch the video on how to never get a dry socket. In almost 40 years of practice, I've never gotten a dry socket because I pack the mandibular sockets with this paste and resorbable gauze. Then I'm going to place 230 suture to suture the mandibular wisdom teeth. I'll place one suture in the maxillary to suture that up tight for hemostasis. Now I'm removing the maxillary wisdom tooth, and you'll see I gave an intraligamental injection on this wisdom tooth also. Vertical incision on the distal buckle of the second molar, all the way down to non-keratinized, non-attached gingiva. And then across, make an incision across the distal of the second molar, and then around the facial. Now I'm elevating the flap 
with a periodontal periosteal elevator, and then I'm gonna put that periosteal elevator between the wisdom tooth and the second molar and just torque it enough so I can create some space and place the E301 elevator. You see it coming right out of there. Be sure you always block the airway with a two by two. You don't want to take a chance on the patient aspirating that tooth. Remember the bone is a lot softer in the maxilla. So you normally don't have to cut any, make a trough around the tooth in the bone. The bone is soft enough, the tooth will compress the bone and just come right out. And the, the shape of the roots, unless the roots are fully formed, will usually let it just come right out. So I'm going back in and removing the follicular sac with my rongiers. Then I'm going to place one 3 gut suture. I'm going to place one 3 gut suture for both of the maxillary wisdom tooth. Here's the mandibular right wisdom tooth. You can see here it is right here. And I'm injecting into the interligamental. I'm giving an interligamental injection for profound anesthesia. I'm numbing the upper two. So this tooth is partially erupted which can sometimes be the most difficult time. And we've got bone on the distal of the tooth, so I'm probably going to have to section here. Occasionally, these will roll up and out with that 301 elevator, but most time you've got a section here from the occlusal surface to the furcation and remove the distal root first to create space. And you also have to remove some tooth structure on the distal of the tooth to create a space into which you can elevate that distal half of the tooth. On my distal wedge again, and then using my surgical scissors to cut the periosteum up the ramus so I can reflect that flap. And I'm sectioning the tooth from the occlusal surface to the furcation and elevating the distal half of the tooth. Sometimes they come out in pieces. Now I'm elevating the mesial part of the tooth, creating a little space. You gotta have space to elevate the tooth in too. This is a 301 again. So I'm using a straight shank surgical burr to just drill a hole straight in to that mesial half of the tooth. And I'm gonna elevate, actually use this drill to just lift that piece out. You can use this pointed elevator in the hole to lift it up and then go back in and remove the follicular sac. Here's the orifice, placing the resorbable gauze with the gel, medicated gel. And again, going to put two sutures here, 3 gut. The one just distal to the second molar and one distal to that. To close that nice and tight, control bleeding, forms a nice clot. So you're suturing that resorbable gauze in the socket. And what that does, it creates a matrix for the blood and just organizes that clot. Remember, a dry socket comes from loss of the clot in the socket. And the nerve endings are exposed in the bone. They're not insulated by the clot anymore, and that's what causes pain. And it takes seven days for those nerve endings to form in the socket. So we want to keep the clot in the socket for seven days. Now this is the maxillary right wisdom tooth. I'm giving an intraligamental, I've already given a, given a, a, a infiltration anesthesia, now I'm giving an intraligamental. If you don't give the intraligamental, there will be discomfort. Giving it on both sides, see here's the tooth, so I'm gonna place a, a periosteal elevator here and just torque it just a little bit to create enough space to place the E301, and then I'll be able to roll that wisdom tooth right out of there. Vertical incision on the distal buccal cusp of that second molar into non-attached gingiva, all the way to bone, a full thickness flap. And then cutting around the distal of that tooth, making incision on the distal of the second molar around the facial. Elevating that flap with a periosteal elevator, and you normally don't need to elevate a big flap unless the tooth is very impacted. And then I'm going to place the periosteal elevator between the wisdom tooth and the second molar and just torque it, creating a space for the three, see I'm torquing it now. Then I've created a space for the 301 
E301 Euphredi, put the two by two in the mouth to protect the airway and it'll just roll right out of there. You see the wisdom tooth coming right out. That's a perfect size tooth, perfect root development to extract these teeth. You want about a quarter of the root to have formed when you extract a wisdom, impacted wisdom tooth. If there's no root, it's like a marble and it'll roll in the socket. This keeps the tooth from rolling, but you don't want a completely developed root because if you do, you know, they'll be dilacerated and spread out and it's a much bigger surgical procedure, much more difficult. So this is perfect when the root, you can tell your patients that when the roots of your, of your patient are about a quarter formed, that's when you want to take out an impacted wisdom tooth. You can see the follicular sac, and I'm going to place one 3 gut suture when I've removed a maxillary wisdom tooth. Have them bite firmly on gauze. Now when you've sutured them up this tight, there's usually not much bleeding. So have them bite firmly on the gauze and change the gauze everywhere. There's two two-by-two two gauze on each side folded up. I have them bite on this for 45 minutes to an hour and then change them and tell their ride and the patient to stop changing them when they stop coming out bright red. And that usually is only an hour or so. Normally they'll only have to change those two by two gauze once or twice. After that, have them get a glass of ice cold tea. Tea has tannic acid in it, which is a good coagulant. And keep that tea and the ice in their mouth and keep it cool and let that tea soak back there. Now if they had bleeding more than a couple of hours, take a tea bag, wrap it in one, thick, one thickness of the gauze and dampen it and have them bite down on it. And again, that tannic acid will stop the bleeding. Then, you know, they can put frozen peas on the side of their face also, but the ice and the tea in their mouth are the most effective thing for stopping bleeding. I'll usually give them about eight milligrams of decadron, which is also uh, an anti-inflammatory to minimize the swelling. But frozen peas, English peas on the side of the face, or a glad bag or a baggie full of ice with a cup towel between the baggie and the hand. Put the, the glad bag or baggie directly on the face and the frozen peas directly on the face. Leave it on for about 20 minutes and then take it off for about five minutes and then put it back on. The patient then returns to the office in a week after seven days the connective tissue lining has formed in the socket. So you're not worried about a dry socket anymore. And we irrigate the lower sockets with a scutan syringe filled with half warm water and half mouthwash. And use a syringe on each side and I say take the tip and just run it straight down the occlusal surface of the teeth anterior to the socket. Drop the tip in that little hole and just slowly fill it up and float anything to the top. You don't want to put a lot of pressure on it. Just float everything to the top and do this once a day before they go to bed. And the same thing on the lower right. You do not have to irrigate the maxillary sockets because nothing's going to get in them since they're on top. Gravity's working against you with the mandibular sockets. How long do they irrigate them until they can't get the tip of that scutan plastic syringe in the socket anymore when the tissue is completely closed. That's the dental minute. These, t these techniques work and they work every time.